Hey, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to talk to you about global system science. Uh, the world is facing really difficult challenges today. Climate change is just one of them. The financial crisis is another one. It's unsolved. And wars like the one that we face in the Ukraine, not what you did expect this to happen a few months ago. So the new kind of circumstances and also Ebola is one of those challenges that we're now facing and that came out of a sudden in a sense. So in order to address these kinds of problems, we need to have a new kind of science, global system science. This is a science that basically would address global problems, systemic problems, and I would uh, cut across the disciplines in order to get an understanding how systems influence each other. So this is the kind of definition that I gave in this nature paper about globally networked risks. We're talking here about tightly connected systems in a world that we don't understand and cannot control well enough. We're talking about an interaction and network-oriented view that's needed to get a better understanding. We're talking about a better understanding of information society with the co-evolution of information and communication technology and society. And we're also talking about an effort that's allied with earth system sciences. So we need to find solutions of global scale problems. And for this also it makes sense to make use of all the data that are now becoming available. It means to have a massively data-driven approach and also to engage into a grand integration of knowledge across disciplines. So this is pretty challenging and it can certainly not be done by a single university or a single country. This is a global challenge. And that's why it's great that we have people from all continents presented over here. So in the following I will address a number of different issues that could play into this global system science and opinion information and decision making is certainly part of it. And one interesting question is how do people decide and why do we have this large level of diversity? Is it good or is it bad? Well, people have been using spin models in order to understand opinion formation better. You are certainly familiar with these discrete choice models. What I'm missing a little bit in this area is more experiments really to figure out what are the models that are really describing human behavior. In a sense, we are often assuming these models would describe human behavior, but we don't have proof for it. Um, there is some empirical evidence of phenomena that look like outcomes of these kind of models, but we should really engage into a more empirical and experimental and data-driven investigation of these issues. But we also need to understand better social influence in situations where we can have a continuum of opinions. Here we did actually an experiment that was published in PNAS and we were asking people to estimate the exact answer to a factual question such as how long is the border of Switzerland or how big in size is Singapore. And then people came up with a number of answers, as you can see. The interesting point is that if you average over these answers with a geometrical average, then the average pretty much comes close to the exact answer. This is what we call the wisdom of crowds. Very astonishing. Now, what happens if we tell all those people what the other people estimated in this experiment? So, they would estimate the answer again. <coughs> and what you can see is that from one iteration to the next, they're converging. So there is a tendency towards consensus formation, which we explain by social influence. However, it turns out that actually the average <coughs> over the average of those opinions that are finally voiced is not anymore a good representative of the correct answer. So 
So you can see that the gray bar over here is away from what people expect to be the right answer. So just another the verification, the x-axis is the prior time. Yes. And uh, this the individual was subjected to this do they interact or they they are just informed about the estimates of oh, the okay. others and they don't talk to each other. Now this is concerning because many decisions are taken in committees and many of these decisions are driven by consensus formation. And we often think that's kind of a guarantee for taking the right decision, but it's not. So we need to be careful. Social influence can undermine the wisdom of crowds. So we need to basically check our decisions again and again based on new evidence that's coming up over time. People have been interested in why is it when there is this tendency towards consensus that we still have so many cultures and so much diversity in the world. And that's actually difficult to explain with opinion formation models that assume a continuous scale. So, there are some models, like bound and confident models, but the question is, are the assumptions behind these models empirically justified? So, this is a very active research area, and the contribution we made is that we were looking into the role of individual noise. I mean, the desire of people to be different to come up with own ideas. And if we do that, then we can explain much better empirical facts, such as, you know, sometimes we have this splitting up of groups, like it could be parties, political parties, you know, as happened in Germany several times. And then sometimes, again, parties join, and it all seems to be driven by certain events, but in fact, the, the driving factory could just be this individual noise. So in a sense you could basically interpret this diversity as a result of a phenomenon that's similar to droplet formation right? in oversaturated vapor. So the model that we have created is very much inspired by this kind of physics. Okay, so one of the important and exciting problems when we want to understand human behavior is the micro-macro problem. So on the one hand, there are individuals, they have certain kinds of behaviors, but what comes out on the societal level can be something else. It can be collective phenomena, and these collective behaviors could have other properties than the individuals. And that comes about basically by interactions between the individuals. And the same is important for interaction between companies or countries and so on. So we talk here about emergent phenomena. And this is actually known in sociology for a long time that the whole is not the sum of its parts. So we cannot understand the system just as the sum of the properties of all its components. And it turns out that in certain situations, small deviations or what we call noise or randomness is important to understand actually what's happening in the system. And that's true in particular when the system behaves in an unstable way, such as small perturbations can be amplified by cascade effects. We did an experiment on this where people were of two types, cats and dogs. And uh, cats had this preference to have the blue opinion, and dogs had the preference to have the red opinion. So they basically got the payoff for voicing their own opinion, but also they got another payoff for having the same opinion as the neighbors they were interacting with. There were in a sense, there were sometimes competitive incentives, and then the question is now, what is happening in the system? And as you can see over here, with a small perturbation of this initial completely ordered 
state, then you can have a cascade that leads to a situation where everyone ends up in consensus. And we cannot understand that actually with a deterministic choice model. So if you assume best response, that's kind of an optimal decision given the decisions of your neighbors in the previous round, then you have such a prediction of the outcome. But this is what you find. And uh, if you want to understand that, you have to add some randomness uh, to the best response model. You, you'll end up with a multinomial logic model, actually. And with this, you have a much better reproduction. Now, we, without noise, you have this difference between uh, the, the model and, and the empirical data. Empirical data is up there. You don't see the bar very well. And you can see the stochastic model is describing that really well. Another important problem is to understand coordination and cooperation and the conditions under which they are stable, where they would occur, and conditions under which they would break down. And this is important, for example, in the context of social dilemma situations, as we call them often, where it would be favorable if everyone would be cooperative, so that would be good for everyone, in fact, but um, it's, for you, it's even better if everyone else cooperates, but you don't, because then you have an advantage. So there is a temptation not to cooperate. And that destabilizes cooperation and can drive the system towards a tragedy of the commons, as we call it. And that means we'll end up potentially in a situation that's bad for everyone. And that's why it's a tragedy. Yeah? Now the question is, what can we do about it? And what are examples for these tragedies of the commons? Well, environmental exploitation is one example. Environmental pollution is another example. And overfishing is a third example. And there are many more, in fact. It's an age-old problem. and. It's very difficult to fix. But evolutionary game theory can give some advice in terms of understanding of what's going on in the system and how we might influence this. Let's start with a coordination problem. So here we're looking at two pedestrians that have to walk around each other. But it could also be a choice problem between two competitive technologies such as uh, video VHS and Betamax, there were kind of two competing video systems in the past. And later on we had um, DVDs competing in Blu-ray and DVD HD. And these kind of things happen all the time. So then there is an advantage if both do, or everyone does the same thing. Like both go to the right, and then they manage to get around each other. So that comes with a benefit B larger than zero. But it could happen that one goes to the right and the other one goes to the left and then they're still standing in front of each other they didn't manage to pass. Which means that there's zero payoff because they haven't been successful. Right? And so we have a situation with two agents, okay, so one and two, and each of them has two options to go left or right. And you can generalize this to other contexts, of course. Uh, the success is represented by this payoff matrix. And if you want to know how is the proportion of people doing this or that changing over time, then you would use uh, a replicator equation and plugging in the payoff matrix will end up with this equation over here. And then you would be interested in the station solution. So you set the left hand side to zero and find that there are three station solutions. One is P equals one half, which is a 50 50 situation. I mean, 
50% of people go to the left, 50% of people go to the right. This is what we would assume is kind of the natural state, the natural initial condition for this kind of problem. However, it turns out that this stationary solution is unstable. I mean, a small deviation from the 50-50 situation will drive the system away towards one of the other stable solution. There would be 100% of people are going to the right, or 100% of people are going to the left. And this is actually why you find the emergence of a behavioral convention. So, sooner or later, in these kind of coordination game situations, people will agree on one thing. But of course, there are other kinds of situations that are described by other payoff matrices. And one of them is the prisoner's dilemma, which is an example of a social dilemma situation. And so, it would be good if both players cooperated because they get a high reward in comparison, if both of them don't cooperate and mean defect, they will get a poor payoff called punishment. If one cooperates and the other one doesn't, then the one who cooperates is really bad off, even worse than P, will get a sucker's payoff, as people say. While the one who doesn't cooperate gets a very high payoff called temptation. So, that makes basically cooperation risky and defection um, becomes tempting. Now, that brings us into a situation that we need to ask the question, how can we stabilize cooperation in a society? Because that's very important. And it's known that neighborhood interactions actually are stabilizing cooperation. So I've been looking at the situation where people have been interacting with neighbors in a circle. And then we have randomly added some extra links and increased the connectivity in the system. So as we go from left to right, the connectivity goes up. And as you can see, we, with some extra links actually, and the neighborhood interactions, we're doing pretty well, so we have a high level of cooperation, but if we have too much connectivity, then eventually everyone interacts with everyone else, and in such a situation, cooperation can't flourish. Same thing if you have random interaction between people. I mean, well-mixed interactions. Is it an experiment, or is it just a This is a computer simulation. Right, yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, might this be relevant for real systems? For example, the financial system. And in fact, Andy Haldane from the Bank of England has done the following analysis. He has looked at the connectivity in the banking system and how it changed from 1985 1995 to 2005, and it turns out it became more and more connected until eventually we had the financial meltdown. So, possibly, that was an issue of the kind that I described before. And here is what finally resulted this is the bankruptcy cascade that we've seen after the failure of Lehman Brothers, we'll see that hundreds of banks are failing in the United States, and hundreds of billions of dollars are lost by this. Of course, similar thing happened in other areas of the world. And certainly it would be good if we would be able to stop these kind of cascades and avoid such kind of disasters. So, I'm sometimes using this picture in, in order to illustrate the mechanism behind. As you can see, these are table tennis balls on top of mouse traps. And that's a nice experiment for a rainy weekend. And a single perturbation eventually messes up the entire system. So it's this connectivity that creates basically highways for disaster spreading. 
So every network system does not only have the functionality that you like it to have as a result of the networking, but usually there, there can be other things that spread through the same network, things that you don't want to spread. And for this kind of situation, you need to have possibilities to interrupt cascade effects, such as also, for example, the flash crash on May 6, 2010. Now, would that have happened just a little bit later? We might not have seen the stock exchange open again. But we were lucky, and within about 20 minutes' time, the markets recovered more or less from that shocking situation. For a long time, people didn't know what was the reason for this. So there was an investigation. Was it a criminal act? Was it a human error? Was it a computer error? But it turned out it was just a cascade effect because of the algorithm trading that we have today. And that's what we need. We need to have built-in engineered breaking points that allow us to interrupt the cascades or the system itself to interrupt it. And that's kind of the tricky question. How to design these fuses in the system depending on the functionality so it would make sure that problems stay contained. And from that point of view, I think all global networks have to be designed in a way that they would have such breaking points built in, <coughs> functional breaking points. Otherwise, they're ill-designed, Ill and there is a tendency that they will get out of control sooner or later. And this is exactly what we're seeing you now. Diseases are spreading through airplane traffic you now. Our travels are contributing to the danger of quick disease spreading. Of course, airplane traffic was built for something else, you know, to allow exchange of goods, ideas, many other things. Um, but this is one of the side effects that can happen. And one of the crucial questions, you know, how could we stop these kind of spreading effects if needed? Now, coming back to the cooperation problem, there are actually a number of social mechanisms and institutions that can promote cooperation. And maybe the earliest one that was invented is kin selection or genetic favoritism. We know, however, even though that's pretty widespread in the world, it has side effects that are not favorable such as, uh, for example, blood revenge or also uh, ethnical conflict. And for this reason, people eventually came up with other mechanisms, like direct reciprocity. You help me, I help you. Friendship, in a sense. This mechanism, too, has potential side effects, and too much friendship you know, might cause corruption. Yeah? So one has to be careful too. Do we have something else? Is there is something better, perhaps? <coughs> well, in fact, indirect reciprocity might be a better solution. And this often works based on reputation systems. So I would help you, you would help somebody else, somebody else would help me. If we're all friendly, it's good for all of us. This is kind of idea, but it can be exploited by people, and that's why a reputation system can help to protect you from interacting with people or companies or whatever uh, that would bring you into a situation of exploitation. Then there are other ways of, of course, stabilizing cooperation, such as school punishment through institutions like police or a justice system, but also peer punishment. And people sanction each other if we don't comply with the social norms. So, summarizing this, starting from a prisoner's dilemma situation, 
there are a number of biological and social mechanisms that allow us to transform the prisoner's dilemma game into another kind of game, such as the snow drift game, a harmony game, or a stack kind of game, where cooperation can exist. And in this way, we can promote cooperation. So basically, this is a mechanism design issue in a sense. And it doesn't matter whether you invent it or it evolves by chance. But for sure, it's important that we have such kind of mechanisms. Here is another study that we did. We wanted to understand why do people punish others who don't comply with the norms, who don't cooperate. We call this um, the second order free rider problem. Of course, if you punish somebody else, you know, it comes with a cost, usually. And then the question, okay, why would people engage into such a costly activity if you could leave it to others to punish those who don't comply with the norms. And uh, if you now look into a situation with four different strategies, and it looks a little bit strange on this display over here. So red is defection, blue is cooperation, green is cooperation and punishment of non-cooperative behavior, we call them the moralists. And finally, we have yellow, which are people uh, who punish other people who defect, although they defect themselves. So in, in this case, it's basically a hypocritical punishment. Now, if everyone would interact with everyone else or in a random way, like with, that means under well mixed condition, what happens is that cooperators basically um, win through compared to the moralists because they have these additional punishment costs. So moralists disappear and then the cooperators stay with the defectors and the defectors exploit them and we end up with defectors only. That means with a tragedy of the commons, nobody cooperates. Doing the same si simulation, but this time in a spatial setting where you interact just with your neighbors, leads to a completely different outcome, even given the same parameters, in payoff parameters. Right? This is surprising, and the reason for this is that now we have a segregation effect that creates these homogeneous clusters of people with similar behaviors. And as a result, the moralists don't have to compete directly anymore with the cooperators, but there are these defectors shown in red in between that separate them. Now, the moralists are superior to the defectors, but defectors are superior to the cooperators. So, cooperators disappear and finally, the moralist state. So this is why we have a spreading of cooperation and of a punishing of those who don't cooperate. Another interesting mechanism is migration. So if you have a situation where people are just copying the best performing neighbor's behavior, what you find in these kind of prisoner's dilemma situation is that defection spreads. Yeah? So we started with a cooperative situation, and we added also a little bit of, of noise in the sense that sometimes people do the opposite of what we would expect them to do. With a small chance only, yeah? say, through an error. And, uh, yeah, the tragedy of the commons is the outcome as expected. Now let's look at the effect of migration. In this case, uh, random migration destroys the coherent pattern that we have for people who are living together, and you can see that eventually we also get defection as expected. 
Now the question, what happens if you have people who would imitate the best performing neighbor's behavior that would uh, show a successful migration to within a certain radius where they would move to a location that has a favorable neighborhood, but also these two noises that we were looking at, uh, on the one hand, the strategy flipping, on the other hand, the random long-term migration that was destroying cooperation in a devastating way. Now, what, what would you think that would happen? In particular, if we start with such a situation, well, when I asked my PhD student to do the simulation, he said, I don't think there will be an interesting result. And t two weeks later, I came back. I said, have you done the simulation? He said, it doesn't make any sense to do the simulation. And I was sitting next to his computer and said, no, please do it now, I want to see it. And for five minutes, he was right. And then something interesting happened. So we start with a situation where everyone defects, okay? And then you see the course of the migration, this cluster breaks up, the course of the strategy flips. We have sometimes these blue people who cooperate by chance. Then after a very long time, say 25,000 iterations, and by coincidence we have a small cooperating cluster and it becomes favorable for those to cooperate. And cooperation spreads quickly all over the system. We call this an outbreak of cooperation. And we found that extremely interesting. It was published in PNAS. But it has this assumption that when you do the successful migration, you could estimate whether you would be moving into a favorable neighborhood or not. I mean, if you move from one flight to another, you can have an idea, of course. But then Ernst Fehr, this uh, very famous economist, said, OK, isn't that a green beard effect? And you know before what would happen. And I said, hmm, maybe, but I don't think this is the issue here. And so we decided to come up with an experiment, and in particular, an experiment where you wouldn't know what other people had decided before but you would take your decisions only based on your own experiences in the past. And so what we hypothesize is that people would move to other places or change their strategy or their behavior and so if um, they were not satisfied with their payoff. So we assume that there would be something like a generalized win-stay-lose-shift and in fact, what we found is mobility is increasing success and it's stabilizing cooperation. So this was pretty surprising. Now, another interesting question is, why are humans social? And in many situations, you know, we feel for others, we do things for others, even for strangers. And why is this? I mean, in many situations we've learned, okay, it's the best to be selfish. And if you're not selfish, it will create advantages for others and they would have more offsprings and the selfish people would spread and the other regarding friendly people would disappear. So shouldn't we all be selfish? And we said, okay, let's not believe it, let's simulate it. And we made the following assumptions. And all of these assumptions don't imply other regarding preferences or cooperation. These are assumptions that we make in evolutionary theory or in economic theory, such as optimization. So, rule number one, agents decide according to a best response rule that strictly maximizes their utility function given the behaviors of their interaction partners, I mean, their neighbors. Okay, that's an economic assumption. Yeah? But not imitation, because why should people imitate? Uh, from an economic perspective, maybe that doesn't make 
sets necessarily. But optimization of utility, that's something that economists would accept. Okay? Then the utility function considers not only their own payoff, but gives a certain weight to the payoff of their interaction partners. Okay, that's something that many economists could, would be willing to consider. This weight is called friendliness, and what is important is that we set it to zero for everyone at the beginning of the simulation. I mean, in the beginning, nobody is friendly. Everyone is selfish. Okay? <coughs> now comes the biological or cultural inheritance. Friendliness is a trait that is inherited to offspring, and the likelihood to have an offspring increases exclusively with the own payoff, not the utility function. Okay? The payoff is assumed to be zero when friendly agents are exploited by all neighbors. That means if you're friendly and your neighbors are not, you will be exploited, it will be terrible for you, you won't have offsprings, friendliness will disappear. Yeah? And then, finally, the inherited friendliness value tends to be that of the parent, but there is some mutation rate. Now, the point is that for the sake of this simulation exercise, you shouldn't assume that this mutation produces a, a genetic drift towards friendliness, right? So we specified it in a way that the expected average friendliness would be 0.2. But we'll see much higher levels of friendliness in our simulations later, when the parameters of the model are right. Now, the interesting point is, Homo economicus results in a large area of the parameter space, as many economists might expect this to happen. But there is a small corner down there where a Homo socialis with other regarding preferences when friendliness preferences occurs. And this is the area where offspring are raised with the parents. Something that we happen to do. So we are living under conditions where we expect a homo socialis with other regarding preferences to result. And while there is a phase, an intermediate phase, where being friendly will be exploited, will be painful, in the end, it pays off, as you can see. So in the beginning, the factors earn more, but in the end, cooperators earn more. Because the friendly, other regarding agents can overcome the tragedy of the commons, while the homo economicus will run into the tragedy of the commons, okay? And this is the distribution of friendliness values that you get. So we start with zero friendliness in the beginning for everyone, and then eventually you can see a broad distribution occur with pretty high friendliness values around 0.4, and let's compare that with empirical data of my colleague Brian Murphy and his team. You can see, yeah, there are some individualistic and selfish people, but most people have pro-social preferences. So that confirms pretty much the theory that I was proposing. And in fact, that's something that even Adam Smith knew. So in his second book, The Theory of Moral Sentiment, he was writing, however selfish man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others, and better render the happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it. And I think it's essential that economic theory would reflect this. So, I would think besides an economic theory that assumes a selfish homo economicus, we would need another economics, which I call economics 2.0, that would describe how other regarding agents, be it people or companies, would interact. 
and it might actually call for other kinds of institutions, like other kinds of market mechanisms. Now we've seen that people would come out with different preferences from this evolutionary and learning process. And so it can happen that some people have equality preferences, I mean they would want everything to be shared equally, while others would have equity preferences and would say, okay, let's share proportional to the effort made. Yeah? There are also some political systems which are more equality and others more equity. But anyway, I mean, these different types exist and the question is, you know, what happens if they interact? Well, if you know what type of person you're interacting with, then you, know, you can predict the outcome. But if you don't know, then basically there is a high risk of a transaction failure and conflict. And this is actually what we found in this special ultimatum game. So one follow-up question is, how can we understand what happens in a system where we have different types of people with different preferences? For example, two preferences. Yeah? And the, would be two populations, population one and population two. Now, in this game, which we call the norms game, we have two kinds of rewards. One reward is obtained for doing what you like. The other reward is obtained for doing the same thing as your interaction partners. Now, depending on how big those two rewards are, compared to each other, you're at a different point on this axis. But also, these populations could have different numbers of people. So there is three possible outcomes. If population one is a large majority, then it would set the norm. If population two has a majority, it would set the norm. But there is also an area where everyone tends to do what he or she likes. Yeah? It's kind of a multicultural, tolerant society where people accept others to be different. And so we can basically predict conditions under which this or that would happen. And we would also expect that there would be maybe a discontinuous transition over here and the tendency of conflict at these transition lines, okay? But before I get into this, uh, I'd like to say that our experiments of this kind of situation show exactly these different outcomes. Anomi in this case is everyone would do what they like, and norm formation is where even though people have different preferences, they would end up doing the same thing. And, of course, things can be even more complicated than this. So, if we have different payoff structures, then we can have other kinds of outcomes, and here is an overview of the different outcomes that you can have. So, there is even an analytical mathematical formulas that allows us to understand pretty many situations that can occur in multi-population situations. Yeah, conflict, of course, is something that we need to be concerned about. I was already mentioning that at these transition lines that there would be a chance that there would be potentially conflicts. And so we have also been studying these kind of situations where we have co-location effects, migration effects, and conflicts such as in Baghdad, uh, in Iraq, or also other places. And one of the cities that we have studied was Jerusalem, and the role that actually the effect plays that there are different cultures, different groups with different religious backgrounds. And we can actually show that this social cultural di distance is actually the main factor determining the level of conflict. We're coming up with models that can simulate the empirically known facts, because there are numbers about this conflict. 
allows us to come up uh, also with a study of so-called counterfactual scenarios. I mean, we can basically look into likely outcomes of certain political solutions. And that's pretty helpful. Now, we also engaged into understanding social dynamics by analyzing human activity data and to build new instruments to explore the world. Future of ICT has very much promoted this idea that we would need a planetary nervous system to have a real-time measurement of the state of the world and something like a living Earth simulator in order to look at different scenarios and get an idea of the opportunities and risks of certain kind of decisions. And also a global participatory platform that would uh, support self-regulation and crowdsourcing and many other things. I'd like to focus shortly on the parent nervous system. So what could that do? It could use information that's on the web, such as those many Flickr photos that people upload, to reconstruct places in 3D. So this 3D picture of the Colosseum in Rome has been reconstructed from hundreds, if not thousands, of photographs that tourists have taken. You can do the same thing in principle of any place in the world that people visit and take photos of, like this one. We can also measure and predict conflict probability based on mining millions of Google News articles. And you can see that conflict is spreading actually in areas. So this is basically the impact of the Iraq war. And the entire region somehow was destabilized by this. There are also positive kinds of spreading, like spreading of knowledge. And we have looked into this based on citation analysis, and we can identify the places that are most creative, and we can identify those places that are consumers of this knowledge. And we can also study contents of uh, this uh, knowledge, such as, for example, physical concepts and the trends that we've seen over time in physics and other areas, or cultural spreading. So there's a recent science paper by Maximilian Schich, myself and others, basically looks at how culture was spreading in the world over a period of 2,000 years. Yeah, so I'd like to, to finish by saying that we're currently engaged into building this planetary nervous system. And we want to build that in an open and participatory way, because I think it's important first of all, for people to trust into the system and to benefit from the system. So we'd like to create benefits for everyone, for politics, for business, for science, and for the citizens. And we'd like to create something like an information and innovation ecosystem where everyone can benefit and everyone can contribute. And that brings up the idea to create this personal nervous system as a citizen web building on the Internet of Things that's now created. And we would build it a little bit like Wikipedia or OpenStreetMap. So together, you know, with uh, people from all the continents, all the countries in the world, we can eventually build this information infrastructure for the 21st century. And I'd like to invite you to participate in this. Thank you very much.
thinking about that at all. Yeah, I'm not sure there are already kind of uh, general or universal laws to to apply because we're talking here about complex system with nonlinear interactions. So while there are some universal features of uh, some of these systems, we also have particularities that require special solutions in a sense. I mean, here there's always this trade-off of redundancy, which on the other hand also creates additional ways of spreading. And uh, depending on the system we're talking about, the level of connectivity that is good for the functionality of the system or bad uh, might be very different. And the way these breaking points have to be constructed might be very different. So I, I think this is a very interesting and rich field of research and we need to engage more into this area. For sure, if we have global systems, we need to have breaking points built in, always. Yeah? Um, because we know that these, these complex systems can only be controlled if they have a, a modular structure and they have these self-adaptation mechanisms built in. Perhaps another question there that I would like to ask is, um, given your human decision-making model, can you actually validate it by making some predictions on how event is eventually will form a social network? We have a lot of measurement of social networks. We know that eventually you will form a small world, and uh, some of this uh, network actually will be discussed by the next speaker. Have you done uh, that kind of, uh, like, can predict who will be friends with whom and how eventually will the network structure be like? Okay, we're, we're not engaging into predicting individual behavior for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that individual behavior is anyway hard to predict. The other one is privacy. Yeah, but I, but, 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 but I agree behavior. that uh, the, we should get to a situation where social science becomes predictable. And we're engaging actually in experiments where we would take series that we've developed and make predictions about this or that or that outcome. So we need to have interesting models where they can have two or three or even more possible outcomes. Then put that to the lab or make a web experiment to figure out whether people really behave this way. And this is going to happen, and partly it's happening already, and the question how can we scale it up so we can do many experiments with many people, and we're also working on this, but this is a challenge. We don't have the, the high throughput designs yet uh, that, that we have in gene sequencing, for example, but we will see high throughput uh, experimenting in social sciences soon. Yes, please. <coughs> I was suggesting that in many network systems there would be an optimal degree of connectivity. Maybe not in all, and where this level of the optimal level of connectivity is may very much depend on the dynamics on top of the nodes and links. Right. Yes, absolutely. So I expect many interesting publications in this field. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome.